Winston invited me with Collins to luncheon. He showed us some interesting things, among which was a copy of a South African poster which read, Ten pounds reward for Winston Churchill, dead or alive. We put a bigger price on you, Mr. Collins, said Winston. I think it was ten thousand pounds. Prices have gone up since your day, Mr. Churchill. Collins was a patient sitter, but I noticed that he liked to sit facing the door. He was always on the alert. During the war in Ireland, he was almost a wizard in the way he was never caught. He didn't go into hiding, yet when the military came to some house they had seen him enter, they could never find him, for there seemed no means of escape. In this, and the capacity to disguise himself, he bore a strong resemblance to Lennon, I'm told. He told me that his mother died during the Troubles, and that he insisted on going to her funeral. His friends implored him not to, for it would be putting himself into the hands of the military. But he went. So did the military. One evening, he came to dine with us at the Kingstown Hotel. I didn't know till afterwards that Hazel had saved his life by sitting for half an hour between him and the window where a gunman had been placed. She was anxious that he should meet Horace Plunkett and took him there the same evening alone. I was a little anxious, but for some reason didn't go. Coming back, they were waylaid and half a dozen shots were poured into the car. I examined it with an electric torch and it seemed a miracle that no one was hurt, for there were six people in the car sitting close together. The bullets must have gone over their heads. Collins made light of it but complained of a pain in his side that he thought might possibly be his appendix. And after much persuasion, he accepted my hot water bottle and placing it under his tunic, he smilingly said that the pain had gone. With a God bless you both, he jumped into his car with Emmett Dalton and Joe Riley dashing off into the night. That was the last I saw of him alive. Hazel was pale with excitement and woke up screaming once or twice that night. Next day she was strange and silent. I couldn't get her to talk. She had fearful premonitions. Once, after a dinner party, she had told me that Sergeant, who was present, was about to die, and he died. Now, she said at last, looking away from me, all day I've been seeing them carrying Michael covered with blood. Wherever I go, I cannot get rid of the sight. I got her to bed and sat with her until well on into the night, and at last she went to sleep. At seven in the morning, her fairy English maid came in with the tea. After she'd put it down, she said in a voice showing not the slightest trace of interest, They have shot Mr. Collins, my lady. I felt then, and still feel, that on that night the Irish slew the Irish. They killed Ireland as a force for good and greatness in the world of today, when every horror is committed in the name of nationalism. His body was brought back to Dublin, and placed in the mortuary chapel where only relatives and closest friends were admitted. I was allowed to paint him in death. Any grossness in his features, even the peculiar little dent near the point of his nose, had disappeared. He might have been Napoleon in marble as he lay in his uniform, covered by the Free State flag, with a crucifix on his breast. Four soldiers stood round the bier. The stillness was broken at long intervals by someone entering the chapel on tiptoe, kissing the brow and then slipping to the door, where I could hear a burst of suppressed grief. One woman kissed the dead lips, making it hard for me to continue.